Hello and welcome to a very special evening to celebrate Sally Rooney's Normal People. Uh, my name is Will Rycroft and I'm going to be your host for this event, which has been organised by Faber members in association with Waterstones. We would also like to thank Element Pictures and the BBC for helping to make tonight possible. And a big thank you to you, of course, uh, for registering to watch. We were completely blown away by how quickly all of those spots filled up. Uh, so I hope you are sitting somewhere comfortable, maybe have a glass of something close to hand, uh, and you are ready for the next hour or so of conversation with friends. Um, now to explain a little bit about how this evening is going to work, uh, later we will be joined by the actors Daisy Edgar-Jones and Paul Meskell, director Lenny Abramson and the writer Sally Rooney to talk about the TV adaptation of Normal People which has had so many of us completely gripped over the last few weeks or days in some cases uh, and not a little emotionally devastated as a result. Before that, um, I'm going to be talking to a couple of my colleagues from Waterstones, campaign manager Kate McHale and fiction buyer B. Carvalho. We'll be talking about the book, its impact on readers uh, and what it felt like to be amongst some of the very first people to read it. Kate, hello. There you are. How are you? And there's B. Hi. <laughs> Hi, B. Hiya. Good to see you both. Um, now, as I was just saying, one of the privileges of working somewhere like Waterstones is that you get to read books before other people, before general readers get to get their hands on them. Uh, and that was definitely the case with normal people. Um, I wondered whether we could sort of go right back to the very beginning, before this book was a massive bestseller and certainly before it was a TV series. Uh, I wonder if you can remember, B, first of all, what were your first impressions when you read Normal People for the first time? Oh, it was just so exciting. I mean, we all absolutely loved conversations with friends. And actually, it had just been our fiction book of the month when the proofs came in. So there was already a huge buzz around Sally um, when that happened. And those proofs got snapped up extremely quickly. Um, we already obviously kind of knew that Sally was something incredibly exciting. Um, but on reading Normal People, it really kind of became clear that she was just a hugely important new voice in contemporary fiction and one that we wanted to be kind of watching for a long time to come. Uh, and Kate, um, you were another early reader of the book as well. Can you remember what sort of impact it made on you? Yeah, absolutely. As B said, it was just um, that kind of excitement when sort of you knew proofs were about to um, arrive and then kind of ev as everyone started reading it and kind of being able to discuss it. Um, and I think kind of, a slight sense of relief. I mean, set, you know, difficult sort of second novel syndrome. We'd all loved conversations with friends so much that, you know, you think, God, can I actually live up to it? Um, and the fact that, you know, it was, I would say better, um, yeah. was, was, was really brilliant um, and felt really exciting. Um, I think there's one of those worries as well is that when you read a book that you love, so often if you literally hand it to somebody else to read you worry about whether they will love it too there's no guarantee that everybody will like the same books that you do um but this book has resonated with such a wide range of readers it isn't just sort of millennials who saw themselves reflected in this novel um it seems to have gone across generational divides class divides even people reading outside of their normal sort of reading genre or area uh, and i wonder whether we have any ideas why that might be uh, P, I wanted to ask you that question um well, firstly, I mean, Sally's writing is just so brilliant and beautiful. Um, and I think that goes a long way in itself. Um, but also, I think you're right, the, um, it has such strong appeal to such a wide readership. Um, I think that's partly because it's it, it's literary fiction, but she writes so kind of accessibly and um, with this kind of beautifully almost simplistic style that it's um, just extremely inclusive. Um, also, at its heart, it's just a kind of very contemporary take on a classic romance, a classic love story. And um, I think kind of whether you're relating to Connell and Marianne's romance or their friendship, I think most people can kind of recognise some aspect of their own youth in their story. Um, and that also, I think, goes a long way. Um, but also Sally tackles some really kind of tricky, weighty themes, but she does so with such kind of generosity and compassion for her characters. So in her portrayal of mental health in particular, um, none of those issues are merely plot points. They're, you know, kind of, it's showing the importance of talking about and talking through problems. And um, I think that's really refreshing and really important to see in fiction. And it feels like um, kind of readers across across the world have felt the same way. 
I think as well there's that thing where we often talk about the work that a reader has to do sometimes in order to to connect with characters and that's where an emotional involvement comes from and because there's so much unsaid between these two characters it feels like the reader is so much more involved because they feel like they're the third person in the conversation they sometimes want to sort of bang their heads together and say just tell her or just tell him something and i, and I think that's why it's, exactly yeah and for so many people that has been a reason why they have felt so emotionally invested in these characters lives and and sort of devastated by the reading experience now of course uh Kate, it, it was announced as Waterstone's Book of the Year in 2018. Um, uh, and obviously, I wondered what it was that sort of separated it from the other books that were on that shortlist, because there were some incredible books that year. But what was it about Normal People that made it the book that stood out that year? Well, so um, Waterstone's Book of the Year is voted for by booksellers. So I mean, just very simply, it was the book that collectively we uh, would love the most that year. Um, but also, each year they're kind of, there tend to be a couple of titles um, that are, you know, so good, so popular, so important, um, ideally, ideally all of those things, um, that kind of in some sense come to define the year. And, you know, when you look back, you'll think, oh yeah, that was that, was that year. Um, and I think it was kind of quickly obvious that uh, this is gonna be one of those books um, to fall into that, that very rare category. Um, and I think kind of as, you know, as you said, there was so much kind of, so much discussion, so much, so much noise almost around it. Um, about, you know, various rumblings around prizes and whether it was a millennial novel. Um, but for us, I think it was kind of simpler than that. I think it was just, you know, day after day, um, recommending it to everyone that came in. Um, you know, people people come in, they say, you know, what have you got this great? What should I be reading? And it was just, it was just top of the list. It was, take this, you're, you're going to love it. Um, and I think for, for a bookseller, that's, that's actually a lot of fun when you have a book like that. Now, of course, with all of these people loving the book and heavily invested in it, the, the news of a TV adaptation is often greeted with a mixture of sort of massive joy, but then of course this trepidation, because you think, I don't know about you, but with some of my favorite books, I have no interest in seeing a film version of them or any other sort of adaptation because it, it's mine and, and that's how I want to relate to that book. And so I was excited, but a little bit worried about a TV adaptation. And let's talk about it because it is absolutely brilliant and I thought we could try and have a before the others get here let's talk about why we think it's so brilliant um maybe Kate if I could sort of ask you that first um yeah I mean oh god it was so good and you know again you kind of like you say you sort of enter it with a bit of um a little bit of trepidation I think I think the great thing is when you get when you get an adaptation of something that is that is sort of this good the kind of the joy of that is that you can you can stop having that conversation about which one is better um and you can actually you can actually just see the like the incredible thing about about adapting something is having another way into that story um obviously sort of different different mediums you know different ways that we tell stories kind of inherently have different things that they'll pull out of those you know books tv uh, theatre will will come at it from different angles. They'll highlight different aspects of the story. Um, so it's a way that you can uh, sort of relate to it in a different way. Maybe understand something different. Get get something else out of it. And I think you know um, anyone who loved either the TV or the book is very lucky that that both exist. Um, and I think in particular for normal people, um, I mean a novel kind of maybe inherently you know one of the sort of maybe the, maybe one of the defining things about a novel is that it lets you into the kind of the inner life of the characters in a way that you know those other things maybe um will do in a different way um you know their kind of their thoughts are laid out on the page for you um and i think i mean ugh, these characters are such enigmas um you know to us each other to themselves um i think it's actually um it's actually really um really kind of a complementary thing um to have both of these and to have to have something you know, you, if you've come from the TV, you can um, pick up the book and sort of dig into it in, in a bit more detail. Uh, and B, what, what has been the sort of thing that you think has made the TV series such, you know, so impactful? I mean, the performances are just incredible. Um, I think the way that Sally's world was kind of realised on screen was just kind of beyond anything that we could have imagined. Like you say, it's so stressful in a way um kind of imagining how how that might happen you think oh god i hope they do it justice and they they've done more than that it's absolutely fantastic and like kate says it's just such a great companion 
um, when I finished it, I just immediately wanted to go back in and reread the book because I didn't want to be left without the characters. Um, and actually, there are so many kind of subtle um, differences or ways in which the um, the actors have kind of elaborated on on character traits or um, you know various scenes that are played out in a bit more detail in the book. Um, that actually it was like kind of having extra episodes in a way or or like watching the tv was like having extra chapters and um and that was really cool and it's just you know as a bookseller it's just so fantastic to think how many more people are going to be introduced to sally's writing as a result of this because oh god they're in such a treat it's um it's just such a it's such a fantastic book to to read in its own right and um and yeah we're so pleased to be able to share it with more people I think that the sort of one of the things I was worried about when I first heard about the TV adaptation was that it was going to be 12 episodes. And I thought, it's not that long a book. How are you going to run it out over 12 <laughs> episodes? And weirdly, that is one of the huge successes for me of this TV Absolutely. series. Is that the, the episodes are quite short, you know, they're sort of half an hour, maybe a little bit less. And they allow the, just the right amount of time to play out these actually very episodic parts of Marianne and Connell's life because of mm -hmm. course their relationship is separated by either these breaks from school or the break from school to university or indeed just the on-off nature of their relationship and so each episode gives you this kind of flavour of, of a particular moment and then it ends and you move on to the next one and actually the the fact that the credits roll at the end, you know, end of 27 or 28 minutes was a perfect way of finishing that thing and then waiting to see what would happen next. And so, in fact, the TV adaptation added something uh, to that way of telling a story rather than taking something away or sort of spreading it too thinly. Um, and I agree with you both. The casting is just perfect. And, you know, Fantastic. actors are often, they're often quite sort of, actors spend quite a lot of time talking about the casting of other actors and things and sort of, oh no, I, they've got that wrong or I would have done it much <laughs> better. But there is not a, a Bum piece of casting in this whole thing and what's amazing is that every single person whether they've got one line or several scenes makes a huge impression and that's really impressive and I'm not yeah. quite sure how they've done that but maybe it's to do with the, the breadth and depth of the writing. Um, you mentioned B that that it sort of it does encourage you even if you have read the book to maybe go back to the book and in fact uh, the TV series, if you haven't read the book, might well encourage people to go and read it for the first time. And that seems to me to be a huge success because it'd be very easy to make a brilliant TV series and kind of go, well, that's it, that's done, I don't need to read the book. So I wonder what is it that that makes you want to go and read the book again? I have some theories, but I'm going to go over to you. <laughs> well, I think part of that is, um, like you say, the the kind of quite brave decision, I think, to to give it time to develop and to use the 12 episodes to to let their character and their characters and their relationships kind of organically build as it were and um it gives it such a sense of depth that i feel like you know you you just want more and you i think it's a it's such a skillful thing for them to have, have achieved and i don't think they could have done that if they had tried to squeeze it into um into fewer episodes really uh, and how about you kate do you have any theories about why the book stands up so well that you would want to go back to it if you read it before or, or want to read it for the first time if you've just watched the tv series i think kind of um as as you've both touched on i think i mean I, I was kind of i was a little bit concerned about it being 12 episodes as um as well sort of you know worrying worrying about what that might um entail but it's there is such depth there um, and I think you you come to the end with kind of with with answers but also with questions and I think um, as B says you kind of you just want to spend more time with the characters more kind of time understanding them um, you know you don't quite want it to end. I, well no it's, I think that's exactly it so so many people of course will finish the book and, and wonder what happens to them next um, but will want to spend time with them again even though it's sometimes very very painful <laughs> And I also wondered whether there's an element of you that thinks maybe if I read it again, it'll go differently, or yeah. I'll sort of, you know, maybe it'll all just be happy. But oh, well. because there is, uh, 
bless me, eh, and my poor <laughs> naivety. Um, but I think there's that after having finished the TV series, um, I mean, we don't want to sort of, if anyone hasn't quite got to the end, we don't want to have any spoilers, but there's something about the tone of that sort of final scene, um, which does immediately make you want to start all over again. And I think yeah. like some of the best books, they have a way of rounding themselves off, which means that they almost come full circle and, and mean that you would quite happily pick it up and, and start again from page one. Um, I think oh. the thing as well about, you know, why it kind of resonated. I think, you know, we all sort of understand those things about, you know, opportunities missed, mistakes made. Um, maybe you could, maybe you could redo it if you just read it again. <laughs> and understand the characters and their motivations a bit more. You kind of think, if I go back to the beginning, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll get what they were doing, or you know, and like you say, actually, um, about the the kind of wider cast of characters, um, you kind of want to return to them and and see how you know. I'm thinking of one in particular, but again, with, with, without wanting to any spoilers, you kind of want to go back and see if there are any clues to what happens later. Um, I definitely want to rewatch it for that, but it did make me want to kind of delve back into the book. Um, I was obsessed with Connell's mum in particular. I think she gave an absolutely wonderful performance. Um, such a lovely character. She she <laughs> was absolutely incredible. In fact, I think both mums were, were really brilliantly portrayed. Yeah. And I think there was something about the, particularly I think the dialogue between Connell and his mother, the conversations they have, and there's something between them which is the sort of moral centre actually of the book and this idea yeah. of behaving with integrity and with decency, um, which I, I think I picked up even stronger in the TV series. Than I did when reading the book and I guess that's a huge testament to the to the actor involved. Um, yeah. Obviously you've both read Conversations with Friends and Normal People and I just sort of wonder for those who haven't read her what are the sort of qualities of Sally Rooney's writing that you would sort of pick out as making her exceptional and, and worth picking up? Um, there is something very conversational about her writing really, it's very organic um, and very as a kind of simplicity and an immediacy um, to her writing, which I think makes it extremely accessible. And the way in normal people, the dialogue is is kind of mixed in. It's 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 without punctuation, um, without quotation marks, and it just it has this flow, which is um, which is really outstanding, I think. And um, I think that's what makes for such a kind of smooth reading experience with her. She doesn't waste words at all. Every word is is beautifully placed. Uh, and how about you, Kate? Um, for me, it's the it, it's the kind of honesty. It's um, you know, we might we might think we don't understand kind of the ways that the characters act sometimes, but actually, there's particularly when you kind of you know you sort of see their motivations and sort of you know read the thoughts behind them. I think you know there there are things that people might might be embarrassed to admit that they do think. Um, but that's that's getting to the truth of something, and I think that's that's kind of why it, it feels so powerful. I suppose there is something where if you have that specificity of of characters who are from particular backgrounds and or have sort of particular backstories, but a, a universality to what they're going through, which is finding mm -hmm. somebody and not necessarily knowing how to tell them how you feel or not understanding your own feelings. And that seems applicable to anybody, no matter their age or background or class or wherever they come from. But it's a hard thing to get right, isn't it? I mean, it's a, I think Normal People is the kind of novel which you might read and kind of go, oh, well, you know, I reckon I could dash off something like that, but it's actually incredibly <laughs> difficult to get that right. To see that yeah, good luck with that, Will. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh no, no worries about that. Don't worry. Um, fantastic. Well, listen, uh, Kate and B, it's been fantastic to talk to you uh, about the book. Um, we shall be awaiting, of course, Sally's next novel, should it arrive in the future. Uh, but until then, you can enjoy the rest of your evening. Take care. Bye. Will. Thanks, Will. So now uh, it is time to welcome the cast and creatives uh, of the BBC adaptation of Normal People. Uh, Sally Rooney is the best-selling author, as we have mentioned, of Conversations with Friends and Normal People, and she was the co-adapter of the TV series. Lenny Abrahamson is the director of films like Frank and Room, and he directed the first six episodes of the television adaptation. And the actors Daisy Edgar-Jones and Paul Meskell are the people responsible for bringing Marianne and Connell so brilliantly to life on our TV screens. Sally, Lenny, Daisy and Paul, 
welcome and thank you so much for joining us it's a real privilege to have you here i think we have to wave or something like that don't we thank you <laughs> thank you now i don't know whether you heard uh everything that we were saying beforehand it was all quite gushing your ears may have been burning ever so slightly uh paul with your noted blushing skills, I'm almost certain that your ears were red uh, just now when we were talking. Um, it's great to have you here. Sally, I'm actually gonna begin with you, if I may. Um, you did an event uh, at Wolfstones in Leeds when Normal People was first published. Um, and you mentioned how funny it was when people would come and talk to you about the sort of motivations of your characters, these people that you'd made up in your head. Um, but of course, in adapting the book for the TV, you must have been dealing with motivation once again for your actors. And I wondered if you give us a little bit of an insight into the process of moving normal people from a novel to the screen. How did that work for you? Yeah, sure. Well, yeah, it's, it's funny. Like when you say that I said that, I can't remember saying that. Um, and for <laughs> me, I feel like I, the weirder thing when I have these conversations with people about the motivations of my characters, the weirder moment is when I remember that these characters don't actually exist. It's like I can get 20 minutes into the conversation about like breaking down their, you know, childhood experiences and their psychological hangups. And then I remember like, oh yeah, this person <laughs> didn't actually really have a childhood because I invented them and only began writing about them at the age of whatever. Um, so it, it always feels to me, especially, well, all the way through writing a project that the characters are actually real people. And my job is like, to do justice to them, um, which which was very much the same in in writing the novel and in and in trying to adapt it for the screen. It was always holding this idea of these people as sort of fully fleshed out human beings and trying to do justice to their journey. Um, and it's simply, I think, for me, was trying to learn the the different toolkit that's available to you as a screenwriter than than what you have available to you as a novelist. So of course, as a novelist, you have um, the page and you can use that to sort of um allow your reader to jump in and out of a character's inner life you know like uh marianne thought this or felt this while she was saying something that gave quite a different sort of um appearance to the people around her you can't obviously in quite the same way do that as a screenwriter um so you have to learn new skills to try and convey the interiority of the character and working with Lenny and working with Alice and um, yeah it was really important for me to try and figure out like well okay I've had to put away certain tools that I used to rely on as a novelist what tools do I now get to take out of the bag that I didn't get to use before so it was really it was interesting but all, all along it was very much a case of just holding these characters particularly Colin and Marianne but also all the all the characters in the book and trying to do justice to their sort of complexities in a new way I think. Uh, you, you mentioned that working together with Alice Birch um, and so well, it's never the case of course that a novelist just sits in their garret and creates a novel and sends it out into the world it is collaborative because you work with an editor and things like that as well but what was it like then working with Alice in, in a more collaborative way in bringing that story to, to a new audience? Yeah, it was it was it was amazing, and it was for me um, like I'm such an admirer of Alice, and I felt incredibly lucky to get to work with her because it was really a case of like her teaching me what to do and me learning a lot and, and trying to learn as quickly as possible from her. So it was like I mean the the great thing about working on this project was I think from the very beginning everyone involved on the creative side had a really strong and shared vision vision of what was really important about this story. Like I think, mean, what were the important elements of the story that we wanted to make sure were sort of preserved and, and fleshed out fully. And we all felt it was like these two individuals and their richness as human beings and also um, the connection between them, the dynamic between them and, and how that shifts. And so it felt like from the start, that was what Alice wanted to help me learn how to do in a new way. Um, so it was, I mean, I, like, I absolutely could not have done any of it without her. Um, but it, yeah, it was fascinating. I mean, it doesn't obviously, you know, it, 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 it was tough as well because I'm so used to working in such a um, solitary way. I mean, like, and I'm in awe of like, even the very minor visits that I did on set, I was in awe of Lenny and what the actors were doing because like, it's so collaborative. And for me, I'm like, <laughs> to do anything creative, I need to be almost in a sort of sensory deprivation tank, not taking any interactions. With them. So I'm in awe of what, of what they do and, of, and watching what they did was such a pleasure for me on so many levels. But um, yeah, I mean, 
in terms of the collaboration with Alice, it was all a learning curve on my part, but I felt so lucky to be working with her and I'm such an admirer of her work. And obviously having you working the adaptation means that there is this kind of, um, you've got a connection obviously by having written the novel. And so I think for a lot of readers, there was this relaxation that knowing that you would be steering it and that it would maintain its centre. But I wonder whether there were any things that sort of changed in the adaptation. I certainly felt when watching the TV series, um, from remembering reading the novel, I was like, oh, Connell is sort of much more sympathetically portrayed here than I remember in the book. And then, and actually Marianne seemed much more of a, an arse actually at the beginning. Sorry, Daisy, we'll come to you later. Uh, but you know, mm -hmm. she, the way that she was behaving at school, I was like, oh, God, I don't really remember her being like that. And I thought it was quite interesting how my memories of reading the book were sort of influenced by then changing, well, by watching the TV series. But I don't know whether you felt you'd had to make anybody more or less sympathetic, or was it just simply about moving the story into this other medium? Yeah, I think um, it's, it's really funny to me the way that people describe characters as being sympathetic or unsympathetic, as if that's an objective quality that the characters have, whereas it's actually what you're describing is your own response to the characters, which is obviously fair enough. I mean, people have a different range of, of responses to their characters. Like, to me, both my protagonists were very sympathetic because they were obviously myself. <laughs> like I was them. So I sympathize robustly all the way through the process. But I, I but I completely understand what you're saying. And I also think it has to do with the the different approach that a, a reader will bring to the approach that a viewer will bring. So because I think as a reader, maybe your relationship with the text is different from the relationship that you have with a visual medium like TV or film. So I wonder, and I also wonder if it's because like, Paul and Daisy are so compelling and charismatic to watch that you just feel like, wow, I love them. <laughs> In a way that like reading, it's a, it's a more gradual process of getting to know and getting to like the characters. You don't have that, like you don't have charisma to help you along, you know? So I don't know, I think it's a, it's a, it's a lot of different factors, but I certainly didn't feel that we decided, oh, we've got to make them, you know, more likable because the characters in the book are so awful. I think they maintain most of their deep, profound flaws uh, from the novel into the TV show, I think, yeah. I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, Lenny, I'm going to move on to you now. Obviously, a director always has a sort of a huge sense of responsibility uh, with whatever they're working on. But I think, obviously, with this story, you had the responsibility of two young actors sharing vulnerabilities uh, and also, of course, the responsibility of, of realising this story, which had been loved by so many readers. I just wondered what was keenest in your mind when you actually set to work on making Normal People? I mean, I suppose there's something that we've talked about and was talked about by the others earlier on there's a kind of intimacy in the novel it's not just the intimacy the very palpable intimacy between the two characters but there's also the intimacy of the experience of reading it which is very particular in the novel and I felt it when I read it the first time and it's the sort of I don't know there's something about I think Sally's voice or the voice she constructs within the narrative from in her writing seems really close like it's not about, I mean, every the, the, the problem of trying to capture the interior of characters exists in any piece of screen drama, whether it comes from a novel or not. I mean, it's always, that's always the challenge. But there's something particularly close and, and delicate about the voice that I felt was the biggest challenge. How do you make it feel like it's really alive, that there is, that they are present as real people? Because they clearly are real people for Sally and they become real people for the readers. They're not they're not kind of functioning within a, a a kind of calculus of ideas, even though there are ideas there. They are, there is this sense of encounter, which I think everybody who loves a novel feels. So that was one really huge challenge. And the other challenge is, well, there's always that awareness when, it, when a novel is very loved. You know, there are a lot of people out there who are ready to eviscerate you if you damage the thing that they're, you know, that they feel is very precious. And that came upon us gradually because when we, Originally, myself and Ed Guiney and Element Pictures um, went to try and get this book to make because we felt so passionately about it. It hadn't been published and it was, it was in the process of putting it all together that it just started getting bigger and bigger and you realise the thing that you're holding in your hands has a lot of um, family, if you know what I mean, you don't want to, to hurt it. Um, and then there was with Paul and Daisy, you know, that uh, you, you alluded to the kind of 
the the vulnerability of of the characters and indeed the kind of the scenes of 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 kind of physical intimacy which have to be done really done justice to they're so beautiful in the novel and then as a group of people daisy myself paul and the the rest of the creative team sally herself and alice and then wonderful woman we worked with called dj o'brien who's an intimacy coordinator I had to find a way of doing that in a way that is both empowering and um, creatively collaborative, safe for everybody, and actually does justice to the to the those qualities of 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 kind of the centrality of that physical relationship that the characters have in the novel. Uh, I mean, Sally mentioned her sort of amazement at the, the collaborative nature of, of a film set and, and how something like that is made. For, for you, is it very much about assembling the right team on a project and knowing that you trust every single one of them? Yes, completely. And there are just these key people. And if you get the choices wrong, it becomes, in, it's like a stone in your shoe of, you know, very large, jaggedy one. And um, if that's even a word. And, um, <laughs> but the first, the first, the key thing, I mean, having the team that I work with all the time on this, you know, I've made many films with the same team, some very important people at the center of that, then the relationship with with Sally and with Alice central and then on set a whole new series of relationships come and, and finding the, the cast casting Paul and Daisy is the key I mean like there really was no version of this no matter how well any of us had done our work it would all flounder founder even against the sort of that mistake if we weren't if we hadn't cast it correctly but Susie Lavelle who's the cinematographer of my section particularly, and then Kate McCullough, who did The Last Block, um, and Hedy McDonald, who directed The Last Block. All of those people are so central to it. And when you're on the floor and working, it's it's about, I mean, I think the way to find the intimacy that I was talking about before is in a kind of conversation with those people and in a mutual listening and watching to what's occurring and being sensitive to it and being prepared to adjust when it's not working and you know, it's it's a lovely alchemy when it works, and and in this case, I think the team was just a lovely humming sort of uh, machine. By the time we really started to put it together and make it, you've mentioned uh, your, your actors there, and it's time to to hear from them now. Uh, Daisy, I'm going to come to you first because I want you to confirm whether it's true or not. In fact, that when you found out that you had got the role of Marianne. Uh, your flatmate was actually working in Waterstones and was sort of cock a because it had been named as Book of the Year. Is that true? Yeah, so I, I got the call and I was sat on my bed and, like, I, obviously my agent rang me and I sort of went, Bleh! and then, like, put the phone down and sat for a little bit because no one was home. Like, just wanting someone to come home so I could tell them. And then Lee and my flatmate came home and I told him and he was like, it's the Book of the Year because, obviously, he worked there and he'd been, like, he loves it and he loves conversation. So he was obviously selling it every day and saying how wonderful it was. So he, yeah, he just couldn't believe it really. I love it when a plan comes together. It's meant yeah. to be. Um, I, I was trying to work out why Marianne is such a fascinating character. And the slightly cliched way I could think of describing it is that she's, she's slightly like an iceberg in that there is the part of her that you can see. And then there are these huge depths that she keeps hidden from those people around her that she doesn't express. And I wondered, first of all, whether you sort of agree with that and whether having the novel to draw on as an actor was useful for you to sort of, to, to explore some of those depths and, and to have things to play. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, I think she's an incredibly deep person as is Connell. And I think Sally captures that so beautifully in that, you know, and I think that's the joy of kind of, um, of acting really is, is being able to, imagine a hole in a life that somebody else has you know we all walk around with big deep inner lives that we only think about our own you know we don't sort of acknowledge that everyone else has one too so I think it was like I, I don't I can't imagine ever working on something now without such an incredible depth of of knowledge about your character I mean I think that it was so wonderful that you know we came to scenes and it wasn't there was often not a load of dialogue and and I think that's what was so joyous about playing those parts is you just you just read the the chapters and you imagined them and you could kind of tell a whole story just with a small look or just with a a breath and and I think that's what's so beautiful about you know the way that um everybody chose to adapt it is that you know we allowed for moments of thinking which I think is what's so beautiful about the book is we get to read these people's thoughts and they are beautiful so yeah it was amazing 
Uh, sort of, um, Lenny was mentioning obviously the, the sort of safe environment that was created on set in order to be able to explore some of that sort of physical intimacy. And you mentioned there that in the book, there are these descriptions of what is happening. And I wondered whether when it came to filming those physical scenes, whether there were big descriptions of what should happen in the script or whether it was simply about creating an environment where the two of you felt safe enough to explore and express. Because as you say, it's almost like dialogue, the physical language that's being used, but without words was were you sort of is it improvised or was it very clearly worked out how did that work me or for, well, for you daisy <laughs> yes sorry um well so actually they weren't they weren't massively detailed in the script i mean that you know it would, it would often be sort of um the dialogue obviously and then we'd have the kind of you know it would be written but i think that it really was when we came to set with kind of Eta and with the team with lenny and susie that we kind of really talked through um, what was going on in the scene and why we were kind of what the story and the narrative we were telling with those with that physical moment as well because I think that's what you know Lenny's talked about it a lot about how um it was always wanting to be a continuation of the dialogue scene it isn't like a separate moment and and they both feed into the other so I think um it was kind of um really when we got to set that we sort of really thought about it and talked about it and worked it out and then um we kind of worked with Ethan and we'd have a certain set of kind of guidelines of of what each other were comfortable with and the kind of basic movements and then within that we were free to kind of play the scene like you would any other so yeah um and paul whilst a lot has been made of the sort of physical intimacy with connell's character you had to look at this sort of mental health angle of his character which is a hugely important thing to be dealing with and i just wondered how you approach that very sensitive subject yeah, I, I think that is definitely very true of Connell, but I also think the, the same is true for Marianne. And I think there's a there's, there's an incredibly detailed um, kind of blueprint to pull from in terms of that that subject in both Connell and Marianne. And I suppose the thing I approach, like I encountered that kind of theme on so many levels, having read it. Like, so I read it, I read the book initially, knowing that I was going to be auditioning for auditioning for the show so you're immediately placing yourself inside it and when you get to those scenes which with around the counselor and kind of this descent into that it's both terrifying and also the kind of thing that perversely a lot of actors want to do like you're looking at a, a human being who's in an incredibly dark place and it's part of your brain going like oh i really want to see what that's like and i can't explain why that is but for me then having got the part it was about I think Daisy alluded to it as well. It's about in really investing in the imaginative circumstances and the kind of breadcrumb, breadcrumb trail that Sally leaves throughout the novel. It's not it's something that happens to him incredibly quickly. It's something that we see the the building blocks throughout the series. And and it was about just kind of knowing what that kind of the end point for me in terms of the theme was is the scene with the guidance counselor and episode. And then it was about tracing it back. And, and ultimately, I don't. No, Paul doesn't know what Connell's headspace is. So it's about really being forensic in the imagination of it, which I imagine is a similar thing for Sally and all kind of creatives when you're imagining something. So it's about tracing him, his kind of social anxiety in school and seeing how that progresses ultimately to that point. And um, it's also something I was incredibly nervous to portray because for me, it's it's an opportunity to express something that I wouldn't normally get to do, but for other people it's a reality and I definitely felt um, a massive responsibility with that. I mean, the, any kind of acting relationship requires trust between the actors, uh, but I think particularly with the things that you were doing in this, for both of you, Daisy and Paul, there must have been a huge amount of trust involved and I wondered how you allowed each other or sort of supported each other to be so brave with some of the sort of scenes that you were dealing with and some of the choices that you made. How, how did you sort of help each other to do that? I, I, I don't really know how to answer that question because I think it's just something that I, I, I just fundamentally trusted Daisy and I trusted Lenny and Hetty around me. And I think when, you, when you're when you talking to somebody, like talking specifically to Daisy, we both, I have I have a deep love for Connell as I do Marianne and uh, as Sally said that they they aren't fictional to me even though I'm totally aware that they are 
I don't I know who he is on a very kind of base level and I know that Daisy feels the same way so it was always about doing them justice as as, as well as we could and I think that is kind of maybe how I describe it first. Yeah and I think we were just really lucky that the um the whole process was really fun and actually everybody was really lovely and I think that allowed especially for Paul and I who are quite new to the whole thing allowed us to kind of enjoy it and not feel like we were trying always to pass a like a driving test and get everything right you know we felt we always were safe in it in our choices and if, even if they were a bit wild we you know we could we could play around and that was that kind of allowed us to just feel very safe with them um, with the whole process. Sally I'm going to come back to you now because we've established that, that Daisy and Paul have done an amazing job with Marilyn Connell. Um, I, I was speaking to Hilary Mantel recently uh, about her work obviously with the character of Thomas Cromwell and working with the actor Ben Miles and she said that it was always evolving through her writing of the books and adapting them for the stage uh, and in fact some of the work of the actors then fed back and and sort of influenced how she then went on to write and continue to adapt the story and I wonder whether your experience of working on this as a TV uh, series have in any way influenced how you think of the characters of Marion O'Connell after watching Daisy and Paul at work. Yeah, and not only not only watching it was from the beginning of the process. So like talking to Lenny at the very beginning, you know, we would have phone calls and meetings for who would be asking about, you know, specific aspects of Marianne's home life or specific feelings that Connell might have had about his family and kind of like giving me territory to dive down into that I felt like, oh yeah, there's something there that's worth thinking more about that was maybe on underlying the text in the novel, but that was never fleshed out because, you know, obviously a novel is a process of selection. You can't put everything in there. So there were always from, from the very beginning of the process. And um, I felt like Lenny and I were sort of partners in trying to interrogate, well, what are the things that maybe didn't get fully explored in the book and that we may not even have time to explore in depth in the TV show, but that are underlying these, these characters sort of psychologically and, and motivating them. And similarly, conversations I had with Paul about Connell um, and like situations he would encounter in school, it felt like we were talking about a mutual friend where we were like trying to puzzle out, like, why does this guy act this way? Like, why why can't he just say what's on his mind? But it, but it felt like, a, um, yeah, it was a process of trying to come to a deeper understanding of who these people were and um, and so uh, yeah all the way through the process and of course like watching watching these actors embody these characters now on screen and um, yeah I mean I'm seeing facets of them that I don't think I had the distance to see when I was writing the book so it's not like oh the interpretation of the character has shifted it's like when I see Daisy embodying Marianne I I have a distance from Marianne that I didn't have when I was writing the book because it was just me wrapped up in my head with my word document and I'm seeing you know vulnerabilities and but I'm also seeing you know flashes of strength and and brilliance that like I was in a way not able to see when it was just me alone doing it because I felt like my job was something different then and now that I have that distance of course yeah the actors are constantly waking me up to nuances that I wasn't aware were there and that also in fairness probably weren't there <laughs> that the, you know like, <laughs> they used the part yeah, no, it's been, a, it's been a journey of discovery for me from start to finish, for sure. Fantastic. Well, as we've been chatting, uh, some questions have been coming in from people uh, who are watching. So I'm going to put these to you now. Um, Sally, I'm going to go with you first. Uh, this question comes from Freya, uh, and she asked whether there was anything that was particularly challenging or enjoyable about adapting your book for the screen. Yeah, um, well, thank you for the question. It's, it's been an interesting for me to think about. I think the big one is probably to touch on something I was saying before about inferiority, trying to figure out how do I convey these characters in their lives to uh, a viewer rather than a reader. And that kind of sent me down a whole like avenue of thought that I don't think I would have gone down before um, about like, why is it that as a novelist, I constantly feel I have to tell the reader what this per what is going on inside this person's brain because obviously when it comes to getting to know people in real life i never have that access you know in real life we can only ever judge people on what they actually say and do we can't judge them on the things that they might have been going to say but never did actually say so it felt like to me right this is actually quite a naturalistic way of getting to know these characters we get to observe them even in their most intimate moments which obviously is a, is a very privileged level of access to their lives but we don't get to step behind that barrier and they preserve a degree of mystery that i found quite 
interesting actually much yeah it, it seems like it uh, rather than taking something away it seemed to also add something so what what we were losing in one sense by not being able to say Connell thought Connell felt we were gaining but because the mystery of getting to know people um, is in itself kind of fascinating. And so I loved that process. I loved riding my way through that process. I mean, with loads and loads of help from Lenny and Alice along the way, obviously. Um, but I found that quite enchanting. Yeah, that encountering the mystery of the characters all over again. Fantastic. Um, Lenny, we have a question uh, for you, which comes from Louisa. Uh, and she's wondering why you chose to have 12 half hour installments rather than which is sort of something you'd expect of something more like a comedy format, uh, rather than the sort of six hour long episodes you might expect from a drama. Were there any particular reasons for that? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that like in, in looking at things that have been made recently, I think there have been little hints, quite big hints really, that that something really great is possible in the half hour format, even though the shows that have, have been most notable, like Fleabag, et cetera, are, comedy they are comedy of a sort where there's also a tremendous depth and pathos and and like quality of of truthfulness in the, in how they're observed i think oddly in a funny way you can go deeper in the shorter um episode because you don't have a, you don't need this big sort of plot structure to sustain you through a full hour of of viewing you can be kind of you can zoom in and uh, to this kind of more granular level of of observation and you can take the specific key moments or, or phases in the relationship really subject them to a kind of uh, a, a sort of uh, you know a proper examination and then it's chaptered and you move to the next one and when internally in 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 elements and with the people that we work so closely with there so so before I think, you know, early in the process with Emma Norton and Chelsea Hoffman and Ed and myself and Sally and Alice and everybody, we saw, we sort of looked at it and it felt when you really broke it down, we didn't initially think it would be 12 episodes, but when you really, really looked and you thought, what do you want to talk about and what space do you need uh, to give it to let it really resonate? It felt that these, like that you would need a substantial number of these very carefully uh, constructed, um, very contained episode so it, it it just naturally fell into that shape and and I, and I really like that structure I really like working in that very you know quite circumscribed space for each phase of the story uh Paul we have a question for you now this has come from Sharon uh and she says that both Connell and Marianne obviously make a huge impression on each other um she wonders whether the characters have made any lasting impressions on your life Yes, and I probably don't know what they are just yet. I feel there's no, there's no like, I, I don't know, Daisy will probably feel the same, but I, I lived with the character the minute I picked up the book and I still feel like that process is ongoing and I don't feel like I'm far enough away from it to accurately describe what that is, but I can guarantee you and maybe, who knows, it could be tomorrow I'll wake up and be like, oh, maybe I'm, it's definitely changed my perception of what um, relationships are. Like not just necessarily romantic relationships, but my whole perception of m myself and all of my majorly formative relationships are uh, definitely forced me to interrogate that. And so, but I haven't seen the proof of that yet. Is it, is it similar for you, Daisy? Do you feel like it'll take some time for the, for the, the dust to settle? Yeah, I mean, I feel like it was sort of happening during filming as well that, you know, I was learning so much every day, both from playing the characters, but also just from like, you know, working, working as a lead in something. I've not done that before. So I'm sorry, I've got this blah. So I've learned a lot. I learned a lot kind of, I grew up a lot, I feel. And I think it's just like, it's the maturity of both those characters. Um, and, you know, we'd have, we had a conversation about the kind of, I remember talking about when we were doing the final scene about how how mature and how lovely it was that Marianne allowed Connell to to go and how kind of mature that is that she was able to do that because it was what was best for him and I, I think yeah I've learned a lot about how I guess grown up and 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 you know deep those characters are so yeah I don't know it's hard like Paul said it's hard to kind of really to know exactly I'll, I'll probably know in a, in a few years. <laughs> 
<laughs> we'll give it some time. Uh, there was a question for you, Daisy, which came from Cleana, which is uh, a tricky question, but let's see what you say. What was your favourite line of dialogue and why? It's very tricky. I love there was great lines that, like Marianne said, like, for example, at school, she was like, I object to every thought or feeling of mine being something like we're in some authoritarian fantasy or like um, there was one that she says about like, I love the way she says generally, and I am generalizing. And I remember that reading that in the book and that's like Marianne that she's like, you know, <laughs> um, and she talks about how men, what is it? Generally, and I am generalizing men. Men seem about, more interested in policing the pleasures of women than in, women and enjoying the, their own privilege. Is that, Sally, you are, why am I saying this? <laughs> Going <laughs> along, that's what it's good to me. I don't remember word for word. I think you pretty much nailed that's it. As elegant yeah. as you read it, I think. Yeah, and just again, like if from the book as well. There's one moment where she talks about um, uh, where, when Marianne kisses Connell at New Year's, and she thinks about the way her friends must think how odd it is that two people just as, like can't leave each other alone. And I just love, I love that because that's it, really. They just can't leave each other alone. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I could very happily talk to all of you for the rest of the evening, but I'm afraid uh, we're approaching the end of our time here. Um, we, we were talking earlier, Kate and B and myself, that this TV series really has been a, a highlight for us from 2020 TV. It's absolutely fantastic. And I think that you can tell from any work of art the amount of work that's gone into it. And it's clear the sort of the dedication, the thought uh, that you've put into making this series. It really does come across on screen. and. It's one of these books that has made a huge emotional connection with its readers. And I can't speak for all of those readers, obviously, this evening, but this reader did find occasionally there was something in his eye. And, and so I can't thank you enough for the sort of the clear work that you put into, uh, into realising these characters in this story. Um, we obviously wish you the best of luck uh, with the rest of the show because it's still airing for some people. Um, but thank you so much for your time this evening. It was really fantastic to speak to you all. Uh, so thank you for your generosity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, for all of you watching, thank you uh, for watching. We really, really appreciate your time and we hope that you uh, hope that you enjoyed it. Um, Normal People is, of course, still available to watch on iPlayer and it is available in its book form uh, from waterstones.com, of course, together with Sally's other novel, Conversations with the Friends, and her short story, Mr. Salary. Uh, from all of us at Waterstones, take care. Keep reading and have a good night.